Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Darius Himes. This is Hiroshi Sugimoto. And I want to just give a few words of introduction um, to this evening's event and just introduce uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto to everyone who may not know him um, uh, as thoroughly as he should be known. <laughs> um, Hiroshi Sugimoto was born in Tokyo, Japan, and in 1970 moved to Los Angeles to study photography at the Art Center College of Design. He then came to New York shortly thereafter and has been based in New York and Tokyo ever since. Sugimoto is best known for his highly formalistic mm. photographic series of seascapes, movie theaters, and natural history dioramas. In each of these ongoing series, which were begun in the 1970s, the artist's philosophical curiosities mm -hmm. are focused on the nature of time, present time, individual memories, the ancient past, and thoughts about the future all find their way into his work, as does the question of the duration of time as recorded by photography. And tonight, our discussion about his body of work entitled simply Theaters will focus on just that aspect. One of the more important measures of an artist's career and their cultural relevance is the caliber and number of public institutions that hold their work. In the case of Mr. Sugimoto, the list is both long and impressive and includes the collections of the Tate Museum in London, uh, the Metropolitan and the Museum of Modern Art here in New York City, as well as other institutions like the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. um, He's been the recipient of, of many numerous awards. Uh, one that I want to mention is the Premium Imperial from the Japan Art Society in 2009, which is, is perhaps the most highly respected award uh, offered to a living artist in Japan. Um, we may have a chance to talk more about this later in the evening, but uh, Mr. Sugimoto's interests and uh, and skills and curiosity about art and craft run, run deep, and they go well beyond photography, mm -hmm. which is a, mm -hmm. um, a point of interest. Um, and just to mention that during the 2014 Venice Architecture Biennale, uh, he unveiled um, a glass tea house uh, on the island of San Giorgio Maggiore, which was simply called the Mondrian. Mm -hmm. And um, so this foray well beyond the confines of photography, all have, their, um, all have their roots, I think, in questions about time and experience. Mm -hmm. um, just to mention a couple of shows that are happening now, um, there is an exhibition of the new abandoned theater's work, which we'll be discussing tonight, uh, at Frankel Gallery in San Francisco, and that work will eventually come to New York. Um, there's also a show at the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography, uh, called The Last Human Genetic Archive, which is a fascinating um, show. Lost Human. Not Lo lost. Sorry, Lost Human Genetic Archive. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, in fall of next year, there will be a show of his work at the Japan Society here in New York. So lots of things always happening. Um, you began your theater's project in 1976 after coming to New York. Yes. And you were still in your 20s, um, and mm -hmm. it's still going on today, 40 years later. <laughs> what, ha what has held your interest for that, for that long? Well, my, my policy of producing my art is I just keep doing it till I get tired of it. But it's never get tired of it. Uh, not as long as it makes a profit. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but the last 10 years, well, th this uh, Abundance Theater series, uh, I restarted again two years ago, but uh, before that, I was so busy with other series and architecture practice, so uh, I was almost so, well, this is probably over. But uh, now I discovered uh, the, the concept, it's, it's in my mind. Well, what, what if, if I just, just, I saw a picture of Abandon Theater, some, some photographer did it, and then I, it just came to my mind, what, if I can do it again with abundant theater, then there's no, no electricity, no power, so I have to bring my own projector. Then I have uh, my own choice, first time, to what movie that I want to see. So that, that's how I started. Will you describe for us mm -hmm. briefly, just walk us through making mm -hmm. that first photograph 
right. in a theater in 1976. Yes. And then we'll move, and then we'll, we, we have a short <laughs> video clip that shows how the current abandoned right. theater yes. project is happening. Yeah. But I want to sort of set the stage with how did it begin? Uh, uh, it's near, near here, St. Mark's Theater. You, you maybe remember there was a, like a Wanderer Theater on the third street and that's 12th street. It was, it's just neighbor. So uh, I was uh, living in, uh, in the Soho that time. That time illegal to live in the loft. <laughs> but uh, so uh, I was, I was, I didn't have enough cash. So this is the most uh, uh, probably, I have to sneak in. To, to test my theater pieces. So whatever the, the theater, easy, uh, no, uh, uh, no security issues. So I was able to sneak in with my huge eight point ten camera with my serious photography, uh, the tripod. And I just set my camera on the side. No, but nobody mentioned anything to you. They didn't no, notice no, no. you. No. Just one dollar. <laughs> For a dollar, yeah, it doesn't matter. But, but I, I wasn't confident at all what the result can be. But amazingly, it just turned out that it's just the, exactly the way I imagined in, in my vision. So you set the camera up mm -hmm. before the film started, and right. how did you and then even figure out what an exposure might exposure be? Exposure was it's a one, hour, uh, no, uh, one movie length, whatever. And then the F stop, I just guess it's just let it wide open. Uh, what's it? Uh, F 11.5 is Schneider 165 millimeter lens. Is st I'm still using it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it was a perfect exposure. This is kind of beginner's luck, I think. <laughs> in the in the in the book in the essay, which you will I will task you all with reading when you take your book home tonight. It's a great essay, mm -hmm. and you do this calculation about frames per second. Mm -hmm. um, when when movies first started, I think it was maybe sixteen frames per second, or even ten. Uh, no, that's a sixteen frames. Sixteen before, frames per second. Before a Toki movie. Before the yeah. right, and then yeah. it and then it has increased to 24 frames 24. per second. Now, now 24 frames. And so, mm -hmm. if you do the math for a two-hour movie, you have essentially mm -hmm. 170,000 frames. Few hundred. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> a hundred and so essentially, the exposure a movie when we're sitting and watching a movie is we're watching 170,000 frames that appear to rejuvenate. And we'll, get, mm -hmm. we'll come back around to this notion right. of resurrecting life. But mm -hmm. they, they rejuvenate this thing that has been captured in front of the lens. Mm -hmm. And what you, with, this, with these photographs, mm -hmm. it's essentially it's a photograph of 170,000 frames. Yeah. So even though it's expensive for prints, per, per <laughs> picture, it's a few cents. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so with all of that in mind, why don't we watch this clip of um, okay. of how the abandoned theater projects um, are happening now? This way. Okay, here we go. This is just a collection of my snaps. Oh, so this is one of the theater. It's always raining, and I have to need I need an umbrella to stay inside. Look at this, it's it's so scary. The bad condition. This is this is Gary, Indiana. So I need a tent inside, and then the cup noodle. <laughs>
looking like a homeless. <laughs> so this is during the exposure. Yes. This is the one in the New Ark, New Jersey, our neighbor. Hmm. Thank well, you. Actually, this is my first time to see myself. <laughs> that was the world premiere. For <laughs> <laughs> um, the the idea. Yes. Th there's several things to discuss here in relation to the theaters project. The mm -hmm. first ones um, involved hi it somewhat. Well, the very first theater was not a historic theater, but many of the no. ones that you then went on to photograph were quite historic in nature. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the. Mm -hmm. The the title of the film mm -hmm. being shown was was never conveyed. It was seeming. It, I think it was essentially irrelevant to the project. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about though how you chose the theaters initially and how that evolved? Um, but the first Saint Mark Theater, I don't even remember what was the movie was because I I didn't pay attention to the movie at all. I was so busy with you know setting the camera. And to see the images, imagine just to, to see the interior of the theater. So I have no time to watch the movie, just covering it and see how the lights travels around. So, so but uh, to, to make it uh, art, I thought uh, uh, the gorgeous theater, like 20s and 1930s movie theater might be, because I was totally unknown, I have to, to start my career as an artist. So. At least this is conceptually interesting, but at least as a as a quality of the prints and photography has to be great enough. Right. And then uh, it, the, as as the architecture of photography, it has to be serving for this kind of market. Yeah. So, so there, yeah, there's an element of mm -hmm. um, of an inter of interest in the theaters themselves as mm -hmm. these architectural places. So, right. like for instance, everywhere from mm -hmm. classic. Mm -hmm. Classic theaters in San Francisco to New York to Los Angeles right. and further further afield. You also, though, very early on, mm -hmm. uh, went to some of the great drive-in theaters, uh, yes. or just yeah. unknown drive-in theaters, just mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. around the states. Yes. Was that, when did that first occur to start? 
was uh, uh, late 80s, 90s. I have to check my book. <laughs> but uh, after I covered most of the uh, uh, indoor theaters, why not just move into the driving theaters? Uh, for the indoor theater, I I was able to receive the Guggenheim Fellowship. That was quite uh, uh, was uh, fifteen thousand dollars in the, in the eighties. That was quite right. big money. Yeah. My rent was uh, pro probably two hundred fifty dollars a month. So uh, I was able to travel around the the United States to search for the uh, indoor theaters. <coughs> And after that, so uh, uh, I used to live in Los Angeles, area, so I knew some of the driving theaters. Quite interesting. So I moved into that driving theater. And so, at what point then, mm -hmm. sort of fast forwarding to the the abandoned theaters project, mm -hmm. um, was there a gap between what what was the time gap between the last indoor theater you had done and then thinking about oh, the almost uh, uh, more than ten to fifteen years. Uh huh. The yeah. most of the the driving theater was eighties, and at the same time, the indoor theater was shooting, was shot. But uh, then uh, uh, my my seascape series started from nineteen eighty. Right. So that was kind of slowed down. My my research, it just covered most of the area. So I, I became a member of theater historical society. They just sent me information with which theater. Right. Uh, is available which theater is restored mm. but uh, at the one one time i thought well it's it's very well covered right so the the flow of your work was initially mm. it was uh you started with photographing the dioramas yes. is that right yeah. and then the theaters and then the seascapes started seascapes, in the 80s right. mm -hmm. um i'm going to quote back something to you from your from your essay oh, okay. in the book um because mm -hmm. it it ties into both the theaters, I think, and the, and the seascapes. Um, you're actually quoting yourself from a journal that you wrote in the 20s where you said, this is from his journal and this is in the essay, just as gold is accepted as money all around the world, so photographs are the global currency of perception. Hmm, sounds very modern. Um, <laughs> the starting point for my work is the, hor is the horizon mm -hmm. where the certainty of perception begins to waver. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Uh, I was a flower children. So I always had a, a kind of hallucinogenic vision. Mm -hmm. Under the drug, without the drug, from, from my childhood, mm -hmm. I, I just uh, often uh, was a dre dreamy child. Mm -hmm. So uh, the photography is the only method that it's confirmed that the, the, the reality exists. So that that's why I, from childhood, I associated photography. Uh -huh. So photography uh, with with locking in a perception. The things that I'm I'm really interested in, I want to, to photograph. Right. Then I I confirm that the curiosity of mine is confirmed that it's there, existed. Right. It's part of mine. You talk about very early mm -hmm. on as a child building little building dioramas models, yes. and even little theaters and building mm -hmm. those things in order, um, and that as you did that, yeah. they 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 made the experience real. And this idea of mm -hmm. it, you you speak about the idea of trying to yeah tether yes. reality to an experience, yes. and that photography then led to feeling like okay this this is now concrete. I can believe in that. Yes. Right. Um, how does so, how, yeah? Uh, t talk to us a little bit about how photography does that for you. Uh, I, I still have this uh, kind of weird vision. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so probably this, the the white screen is my a kind of vision in, in my mind. But uh, you know, even even the, the 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 movie movie images, you you feel it's it's there and it, there's a story coming out. But uh, after the you know seventeen hundred thousand, the the visions it just became empty. Right. So uh, this is this is not confirming this, the the reality was used to be there, but now it's gone with with the light. Mm -hmm. It's overexposed light. Right. So uh, 
what's it, it's not the nothing it's not the empty it's just too much information in there. right it's this excess of exposure right. this overexposure mm -hmm. and and it's it, so looking at the things too much then you don't see anything so right. this kind of you know it's it's a uh, it's kind of mentality mm -hmm. and it's a, it's disorder of mm -hmm. some kind mm -hmm. but uh, i i saw when i was a child this is kind of a uh, illness of my mentality. Mm. So I'm afraid of future that if I become an adult, what what should I do? What kind of profession I have to I, I encounter? I right. might be uh, unable to to adjust myself to the society. Right, right. And I came to to New York and I find out I found out that the, the the job called artist. Right. And I saw many, <coughs> many strange shows, and wow, this is all those crazy people like me. Right. And I can, I can sell my this uh, uh, kind of uh, yield spirit. Right. To the market, it's commercialized. It's able to commercialize my, my spirit. Your vision, spirit. yeah. My vision. Yeah. So this is the only profession I can adapt myself. No, it makes sense. Hmm? You you write in the essay about wanting um, questioning what is what is real. How are how do we know that right. the things around us are real, and that mm -hmm. photography in a way mm -hmm. allows you to hold on to that and yes. to feel like okay, now that it's been photographed, it has its own reality. Mm -hmm. I want to read another quote yeah. to you from uh, your essay. You mentioned that a picture is a picture because it is a fiction. Mm -hmm. A photograph, though, is a photograph because it appears not to be a fiction. Mm -hmm. With a photograph, the medium itself is parody. <laughs> and that parody has a surprise ending that continues ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. In what way do you, how is photography a parody? How do you mean that? What well, do people believe that everything photographs? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a sign of the existence. Mm -hmm. But the, to me, it goes the other way around. Uh -huh. Uh, so I want to prove that things being photographed is not the proof of the, the uh, existence. It's, it's, it might be a fiction. So, the, so that's why I started my uh, diorama series. Mm. The people tend to believe my, my uh, diorama pictures and polar bear is killing the seal. Mm -hmm. And people get amazed. How can you do this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's make me feel confident somehow. right that this is everything's fiction yeah but uh, something wrong with your eye or mentality that if you believe in this is real then right and photography yeah. right photography What's is the a nature nature of your mind how how your mm -hmm. mind works right. i'm very curious about how the human mind works right are you, are you all familiar with the <coughs> diorama series just to explain it briefly these are these are photographs, and we may there may be, or maybe there's no books available. Or there's one book available, but the diorama series were made mostly in the Natural History Museum yes. here in New York. Mm -hmm. And just a step back before we talk about his photographs of them, the dioramas themselves were as m most of us have probably seen them. They are in these you know shallow insets. Um, where you have these taxidermied animals in purportedly in in natural like surroundings, and the back wall is often a, a meticulously painted yes. sort of mm -hmm. backdrop that that alludes to deep space, right? Mm -hmm. So the the entire thing is constructed, um, and many of the artists, the story in doing some of the research, many of the artists that were working on these were working from photographs. So mm -hmm. here here we have multiple layers of. There's, there is a reality where a zebra lives mm -hmm. in the world. And then somebody makes a photograph of that and then brings that back to New York. And then we have a stuffed zebra. And then we have a painting from a photograph of a reality where the zebra lives. And all of these things, when you're standing and looking at those dioramas, you know that they're not real. But when mm -hmm. you photograph them, mm -hmm. somehow the, the, this layer of black and white strips away much of what is seemingly unreal about it, even though we don't see in black and white, but somehow that language almost tricks us. And when you first look at them, if you don't know you're looking at a diorama, 
it's like, wow, how did he get so close to this polar bear killing the penguin? <laughs> yeah, people worry about me. What? People worry. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> you got to be more careful out there. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being banged. And so the, this aspect of how our mind deals with a photograph and flips things around and, mm -hmm. and what's real and what isn't is, mm -hmm. is again. I often explain sometimes to people, I was able to be an invisible man. Right. <laughs> right. Invisible photographer. Right, right. So that I don't get the attention from the animals. Yeah, you've got your cloak of invisibility on there. <laughs> um, you also talk about uh, the camera as a magic lantern. Do you mm -hmm. want to describe that just a little bit? Uh, magic lantern uh, <laughs> or uh, time traveling machine. I yeah, I like says. that, yeah. I can go backwards in the, in the time. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, like uh, like a seascape. So mm -hmm. This is my time machine uh, mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see the share the vision with uh, the Neolithic time man, right. new stone uh, new stone age time. Right. I just want to share the same vision with uh, ancient people. Right. And how can I do it? Maybe we can share the seascapes with those people. But mm -hmm. all the around we changed it. Right. So that that's how I feel and how I think. So I. Standing in the uh, the sea front and the facing the sea, I, I feel like uh, well, I I there's no one around it. I have to go to the very remote place to first to to, right. to to start this. So I can uh, transform myself. My mind is traveling back to the mm -hmm. Neolithic time and then looking at the sea. Mm -hmm. So the camera makes me feel. Right. The, the camera makes just put my. Uh, magic in my mind. Yeah, allows yes. that to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In each of those photographs, they are mm -hmm. completely devoid of anything, even yes. all flora or fauna, anything that could mm -hmm. have changed in the intervening mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of years. Right. And it's this pure. It's a pure yeah. view. Sometimes I that, see a yacht, a small boat. Right. I have to wait till then. <laughs> right. Till it's out of the picture. Yeah. But in a remote place. Those both just came to say hello to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They saw you. Yeah. So, well, please, go away. <laughs> um, in the, it, another aspect of um, of talking about how a photograph can fix reality. So, mm -hmm. you mentioned that a photograph fixes a dead reality in the form of an after image. Mm -hmm. But when you're shown a series of those after images, dead reality seems to come back to life. And that's essentially what this theater project is about with, mm -hmm. the, with the movies, right. is this aspect of, of a movie sort of regenerating mm -hmm. and talking about. Do you want to talk for a second just about, you use this word mm -hmm. uh, resurrection in the sense that mm -hmm. human societies have been looking about and, think, and trying to find a way to, to be resurrected or... Mm -hmm. um, how do you, how, maybe you can share just a little bit about that regenerative aspect. Well, this is the first time to read in my, my English translation. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> but the resurrection, yes, well, this is, well, m maybe after life kind of vision is something yeah. like this. Yeah. That I never explained in this way, but uh, I, I can I am envision sometimes how I die and the, the, the last scene of dying mm. might be some people, like a, a few people return from the near death condition and yeah. always you know, say that there's a brilliant light right. inviting me to, to welcome me. Right. But, uh, so uh, this is just accumulation of time and it's just many images. After the capacity of your experience and time is, you know, up, right. This might be the very good sample of life, right. uh, how people spend the time, and I think this can be a alternative visions of yeah. explaining yes. how people die. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, so how many, mm -hmm. how many theaters have you photographed in now to date? Uh, in my catalog, uh, <laughs> all my theaters, probably more than 100. Wow. Uh, but uh, there's so many uh, pieces which I uh, tried to photograph, but it didn't come out well. Right. So 
more, more than two, 200. I mm-hmm. think. And what about the dilapidated theaters? How many? Um, How many? Uh, yeah, successful of those. Ones? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think maybe uh, more than 100. Wow, wow. But the research was thousands of theaters. Wow, research. wow. And is there any rhyme or reason to which movies you're choosing? Or are they just your favorite movies? Uh, this abundant theories. Yeah. Uh, uh, I uh, decided to, to limit it only uh, disaster movies. Disaster movies. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> For example, Deep Impact is perfect. Right. Deep yes. Impact, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or the Rosemary's Baby. So. <laughs> Well, maybe we can, uh, if you're open to suggestions, the audience maybe can send you uh, lists mm-hmm. of other movies uh. to consider. <laughs> oh, Godzilla. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. So some, some titles being shown here. Exactly. Yeah. So this is, the third, this is the third book in mm-hmm. a project with Damiani. And um, you're, uh, there is a, a great uh, designer that you've been working with mm-hmm. um, yeah. uh, for many, many years, Takaki, <laughs> yes. And um, the first one was dioramas. The next one was the C- seascapes. seascapes. This is the third in the series. Mm-hmm. Will there be more? Uh, the fourth one will be uh, architecture series. Gotcha. The, that's right, the architecture. That's a year ahead of time. Gotcha. We start the building. And then maybe there will be others. You have some other great projects. Um, in, besides photography? Be, photography? No, besides the <laughs> besides architecture, there's possibly others, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh-huh. Uh, well, di- uh, not the di- the portrait, wax portrait. Oh, right, the wax portrait. It's, it's waiting in its way. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, I want to um, open this up for questions from the audience, and yes. we have maybe about mm. 10 minutes or so to do that. Mm-hmm. So, sure. I'm curious as to what criteria you use uh, to reject a photograph that you've done in a theater. Because you said that basically, it seems to me about half the theaters that you photograph, Mm -hmm. you've decided doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So what are the decisions that you make to to, to to come up with that? Well, in early times that I simply couldn't get the permission sometime, and then uh, uh, even uh, it just uh, just make it black, black and white. Sometimes the painted it's too contrasty. The theater itself is badly painted, or I just didn't have enough time time to to keep doing it. Basically, I just stay there till I get the final mm-hmm. negative. I have to confirm the negative. So I travel just by myself with 19th century style. I bring my own processing kit. It's small tray, it's chemical packed. And so I stay in the cheap hotel and then just mix the chemical uh, photograph. The one theater takes uh, two to three hours and then bring back the film to hotel. Sometimes wait, wait till you get the n- night time and then the process and then see how the, the balance of the negative density is. And uh, usually the, the, the first one doesn't work, of course. So the second day go back and then... Same movie? Say, uh, no, no, no. Sometimes that, that they just show different movie. So I, I have to guess. I cannot use my light meter. So uh, this is all, all guesswork. So the, the day before was a brighter movie. Like the spaghetti western kind of it's the brightest movie it's mostly outside but the second day is uh, like, uh, the dark movie sad movie is usually dark <laughs> right right <laughs> so i have to do it uh, again and again till i get the perfect uh, balanced negatives but uh, sometimes uh, the movie changes every day so sometimes i i stayed the, the longest like seven straight days and wow. and then wasn't able to to get the good good one, so uh, it just hit and try. Mm-hmm. And even after that, I, I have to make a print and coming back in New York. I I spend uh, uh, today for for every, almost every day 
I spend four, four hours in the dark room. My morning is very dark. Yeah. <laughs> Before lunch. <laughs> right, right. And I, I make a, like a 30 prints and discard. Sometimes most of them, all of them. So it's just uh, layers of uh, failures. And then finally, it's delivered to, to you. Mm -hmm. No wonder it's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <clears throat> Any other questions? Sure. <clears throat> One series that you didn't mention tonight was your wax figures. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had any comments about, uh, I thought those were fascinating when you were talking earlier about the dioramas and how uncanny it was seeing those because they looked real. I felt the same way about mm -hmm. seeing the, the wax figures. Mm -hmm. Any comments about how those fit into mm -hmm. you know, the course of your work? Well, wax figures is direct uh, tran uh, transition uh, from uh, dioramas. And since I, I discovered the trick of these dioramas, then uh, this can be uh, same thing applied to the wax figures. So I went to see the wax figures in London, Madame Tussaud, and I saw it's, it's weird. <laughs> and un unreal, but uh, I was quite but then you confident. Got it, you got into your time machine. Yes, I yeah. figured out, and then uh, th there was mainly two sessions. And then for first, I got permission just to photograph the the way it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, after several years later, I became more serious. So I I asked permission a special night straight, like one or two weeks. And then I, I paid for that, the service that uh, I set my, my small studio setting against the black background, mm -hmm. drop, backdrop. And then so the staff can, can bring whoever I, I name, the Queen Elizabeth I, please, and right. they bring her into right. my studio and the right. photo. So, so the, if you hadn't, if you, if we ha we've already given away the punchline, which is that they're wax portraits. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't, if you didn't know that and you had encountered mm -hmm. walking into a gallery of, of these works, you'd say, oh, that's an amazing photograph of Shakespeare or that's an amazing photograph of, of <laughs> Rembrandt. Gosh, where I, I wonder why I haven't seen that photograph before. And then you realize, well, photography hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> and, you, and you realize that you've entered into this time machine and that these are, they're photographed in such a way that these objects are so real, but when we're standing in real life, we know they're fake. Mm -hmm. But in, again, in a black and white photograph, somehow this veneer of reality drops away and it seems even more real, mm -hmm. which is, is amazing. Ah, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so the wax portraits, exactly. So King Henry the Eighth. Yeah, King Henry the Eighth, all six, his wives. Six wives. <laughs> and uh, actually, the painter Ho uh, Hans Holbein, Holbein mm -hmm. painted the King Henry the Eighth. Right. The, this is the base of the of the, the figures the model themselves. Figures. Yeah. So this is most likely his his uh, portrait. Right. Right. As a photography. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's an ama there's an amazing uh, photograph that you did in a small museum in Japan, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, is a wax, it's a setting of the Last Supper. Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's extremely detailed. Mm -hmm. And if you, and the way you photographed it, I think it's three, no, five panels. Five panels. Huge. It, it mm -hmm. runs, you know, maybe 20 it's a feet seven long. Meter seven meters. Wide. So they're nearly mm -hmm. life size. So when you walk in and you see mm -hmm. that in the room, mm -hmm. again, you think, wow, this is just an amazing photograph of, mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of the Last Supper, <laughs> and and then you realize again, it's like, oh wait, this is two thousand years before you know photography had been invented. So in my current show at the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography, I, I hung it, and then with uh, with uh, a, a table in front, mm -hmm. mm. and then set up the, like uh, high end the wines, right? So everything's uh, the proper setting, right? Dinner setting. Mm. Right, a real So I can even sit in front of the table and <laughs> right. share the, right. the dishes. Right, <laughs> you, can, you can choose different positions, too, different right. chairs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, other questions we had. There's one here, there's one in the back. Hello. Um, so you talk about this notion of resurrection, uh, kind of the celebration of things being made new again. Um, but your recent series seems to me to be very nostalgic. And I'm mm -hmm. just curious if you consider yourself to be a nostalgic person and to what extent <laughs> that informs your work. 
Uh, yes, I, I'm very nostalgic in mm. life. Yes, <laughs> I'm always you know uh, traveling back backwards in the time. Uh, so my my current show in Tokyo is titled Lost Human mm -hmm. Genetic Archive. I came up with th 33 stories of how the civilization able to be end. How the world will end in yeah. 33 different ways. Right. Yeah. And then I uh, from but from history from, from stories history. that that's different societies have mm -hmm. told themselves right, right. so I uh, it's a mixture with my my collective object with my photography mm -hmm. it's like uh, uh, one example is I'm showing uh, high end uh, quality of uh, Japanese made uh, love doll it's a sex doll it's so well done so mm -hmm. it's better than real. <laughs> <laughs> that's on that's the marketing <laughs> <laughs> it's it's costs about the seven thousand mm dollars -hmm. but that's so well so it, when i photograph it it's it's it's, it's more than real right and that's the story is that the women's power gets so dominated towards all the presidency and then uh, well, the mm -hmm. major corporation uh, directors it, it's just, just uh, women took over the, all the power so mm -hmm. men lost the uh, Desire, the sexual desire of the women, and mm. the older men rushed to buy this Japanese-made sex doll. Mm. So the population is diminishing. That that's the way how the civilization society ends. ends. Right. Society. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, it's kind of a half joke, half serious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you've been a you've been a collector of antiquities for. Many yes. years, and this ties mm -hmm. in. It may, may it ties into the nostalgia question, but also just the interest in mm -hmm. in what humans have have made. Yes, and I have a huge, big collection of uh, Stone Age tools, mm -hmm. so that I can. I just, just I want to grab it. Mm -hmm. Then you you just feel it how this uh, new Stone Age people used to feel. Mm -hmm. Just transfer this information directly right. into my my hands, right. into my blood. Right. Then, oh yes, I remember yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that and that ties into your comments about, like mm -hmm. for instance, the seascapes being this yes, shared right. vision. I would mm -hmm. offer that it's not just looking backwards, but hopefully it's also mm -hmm. into the future. It's also right. the same vision that we can share. Mm -hmm. um, with somebody from 50,000 so years to, from to now. Going forward, I have to understand the back, the, 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 the world behind, history, yeah. the backwards. Then I can project right. my vision to the future. Right, mm -hmm. right. That's great. Question in the back? Yes, so um, my question would be, um, Walter Benjamin came up with this theory about uh, aura and how photography would uh, take away the aura of a motive. And your work seems so erratic for some reason um, that I was questioning if uh, Walter Benjamin's theory in some way influenced your work and uh, like possibly to prove him wrong. Uh, <laughs> Walter Benjamin, yeah. Uh, now, yeah, now, now I uh, can understand what you're saying, but never think about the information mm -hmm. of Walter Benjamin. But uh, pr probably yes. Mm. Mm. <laughs> there's a there's a on page um, mm. five. There's a dr in the book that you've all bought. There's a there's a great drawing from 1976 uh -huh. from one of your sketchbooks. Right. And it's super esoteric looking. <laughs> <laughs> and. And it's it, but it's fantastic, and you can you can all see it. But you you are essentially mm -hmm. breaking down what happens with vision with a camera. So right. at the heart of this drawing, there are two eyeballs, mm -hmm. and one of them has the camera right. up to its up to the eyeball, and on one side is what's being photographed, mm -hmm. and then there's the barrier right. behind which is the image being projected into mm -hmm. the mind mm -hmm. through the through the manifold of right. the senses. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there is this. Uh, then there is, to quote you, the inner vision. However, mm -hmm. is bathed in the aura, right? Oh, <laughs> emanating from Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> and behind, backstage, he said, "That's when I was a hippie." <laughs> <laughs> Probably should have been that. 
but this idea but that was very important yeah, yeah tell, tell us yeah tell me a little bit about that uh -huh. and, and this idea of like trying to understand how vision works and it affects mm -hmm. the mind right so this this small drawing i try to understand my, myself my inner vision how mm -hmm. i see things mm -hmm. and the more and more uh thinking into the the the, the system of how mm -hmm. i see things is well, whether I'm I'm just receiving the image onto my eyeball, right. uh, same as a camera structure, and sometimes I I feel like I have this vision already in my in my mind, and right. I'm just, just projecting this inner vision into the sc screen, so-called right. the world. Right. Yes. Right. So that whether the the vision vision is there and I'm looking at it or I'm just projecting my vision onto the screen of the world and it's just a reflection of my vision is going back and forth. And do you think, yeah, mm -hmm. is, is is there a way to answer which one it is? Uh, that's something like a very Buddhi Buddhistic, <laughs> Buddhistic study that I yeah. was getting involved. Yeah. I, I studied it while I was in, in Japan till mm -hmm. 22 years old. I was more into the Western philosophy, like uh, I, my major was uh, Marxist economics. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> Hegel, Feuerbach, Kant, those heavy-duty German philosophy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, all of a sudden I moved to uh, uh, jumping into the, the middle of the flower children movement in, mm -hmm. in California. And <laughs> people were just ask me about uh, enlightenment and even uh, being asked Oh, you must be Japanese and you must be enlightened. Teach me how to get enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I cannot say that. I don't know anything about it. Of course I'm enlightened, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I just start catching up quickly. Right, right, yes. right, right. <laughs> and then it's, it's just amazing. It's fit my, the way I see things. Right. I think this back and forth. This question is 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 mm -hmm. has been central to photography. Yes. This this question of making a photograph is it just the impression of what's out there mm -hmm. through the camera, mm -hmm. or is it a preconceived idea and right. projecting that onto the world? And it mm -hmm. does feel like a two way street. It's yes. it's a bit of both. And I think so. That this this vision is it doesn't exist in in the reality. Right. This is only the vision I I saw it in my exactly. in my brain. Yeah, and only a photograph can actually show right. that. So the next step, if I after I conceive these images, the next step is technically how can I make it visible? Right. So uh, I I just start thinking about the, the camera and the exposures and movie lens right. and the light balance. So this is intentionally ma made up. Right. But it's it's uh, it's a photography it's right. supposed to be affect the reality right so this is a product of what reality or my my visions it's right. somewhere in between yeah that's why yeah people call can be able to call this as an art yeah i think yeah that it's <laughs> it's not just machine made yeah not machine made yeah exactly extra body maybe one more question <clears throat> hello good evening um has there been any idea or concept that you have tried but not successfully turned into an image? Uh, not not successfully turned into an image? Yes, I mean, these, ah. these are all, you know, very conceptual, ah, philosophical. Yes, yes. So maybe uh, oh, of course, uh, I have a hundred of the, the strange visions. I'm trying to struggle to, to make it uh, visible. But the on, only, only, only surface, only few percent of my visions. It's, it's mm. still here. Uh, but I only announce when I'm successfully <laughs> <laughs> able to, to show right. it. Right. I, I may be able to write it, but, but it's just, uh, you know, I can be a, uh, the novelist or something. But uh, I want to use a photography. It, it, photography is more believable, even mm. though it's not believable. Right. So, this is I like this uh, the medium as a photography as a tool of my art. Right. Mm. I think that's a great way to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>